Hello, and welcome to The Bard's Truth with your host, The Green Bard. This is The Dire Wolves of Winterfell, episode 4.6, Summer and the Winged Wolf, Chained. Our conclusion of Bran and Summer's story in A Clash of Kings. When we left off, the boys were hidden in the crypts and thought to be dead, while Bran used warging magic to lead Summer about the wolf's wood, eluding Theon's hunting party. A Clash of Kings, Cattle and Seven. Before we get any more from Bran's story, Kat mourns the boys, never to learn before her own passing that they had actually survived. She was certain the boys would be safe under the wolf's protection. Because of her faith in the wolves as protectors, she assumes Theon killed the wolves to make the boys vulnerable. This makes her ill with concern for her girls, who have no wolves, as far as she knows. This is a big reason for her folly with releasing the Kingslayer. It's also ironic because Theon himself laments not killing the wolves. Are they? Catelyn said sharply. What god would let this happen? Recon was only a baby. How could he deserve such a death? And Bran! When I left the north, he had not opened his eyes since his fall. I had to go before he woke. Now I can never return to him or hear him laugh again. She showed Brienne her palms, her fingers. These scars. They sent a man to cut Bran's throat as he lay sleeping. He would have died then, and me with him. But Bran's wolf tore out the man's throat. That gave her a moment's pause. I suppose Theon killed the wolves, too. He must have. Elsewise, I was certain the boys would be safe so long as the dire wolves were with them, like Rob with his gray wind. But my daughters have no wolves now. A Clash of Kings, John 7. We next get a mention of Bran's wolf from John. Somehow he never got word before his ranging of Summer's name. I suppose it's because he didn't read the whole letter, just scanned it. He is expecting to die while ranging with Quarren and is wondering how ghosts will mourn him. Note that he is also speculating about the ability of the wolves to sense each other over long distances, and whether they'd also know if he died. We'll come back to this later. It will be good to feel warm again, if only for a little while, he told himself, while he hacked bare branches from the trunk of a dead tree. Ghosts sat on his haunches watching, silent as ever. Will he howl for me when I'm dead? As Bran's wolf howled when he fell, John wondered, will Shaggy Dog howl? far off in Winterfell, and Grey Wind and Nymeria, wherever they might be. John can feel the pack bond indeed. Through Ghost, of course. A Clash of Kings, Bran 7. With Bran's final chapter in this volume, we get confirmation that Bran and Rickon are alive. But first we see from Summer's perspective the aftermath of the battle, with Winterfell in flames at the hands of Ramsay. Note how Bran relishes being a wolf, a callback to his wishes early in the volume. When he wakes, he needs to be forced to abandon the wolf's body, but he does so consciously, another step up in his warging abilities. The reeds are concerned for his nourishment. The wolf was full, though, so Bran can't fill his own appetite much. Given that the wolf and boy mirror each other's motions, it follows that their appetite slash hunger, or lack thereof, would mirror as well. In the cases where both are hungry or both are sated, the emotion would be heightened. So here, where Summer has fed, but Bran's body is hungry, we see how the boy is a bit confused about having eaten, but still feeling hunger. Bran has finally embraced his identity as the winged wolf, or Bran the Beastling. The passage to follow is our first indication of Bran actively using his powers in summer. He seems to have been doing this a lot during their time in the crypts. Also, note that he mentions an event where he was able to use the weirwood net to contact John through Ghost. We'll cover that with more detail in later volumes. That would be the first instance where he uses the weirwood net to communicate directly. This represents a big leap in his abilities, although he is not even sure what happened. One explanation for Bran's leap in ability is that he was forced to develop his powers because of his sensory deprivation in the dark of the crypts. The wolf bond called to him in the dark where his two eyes didn't function. His third eye began to open in response. With that opening, his bond to Summer strengthens, and so does his ability to use his other telepathic gifts. Think of the telepathic power as a sixth sense. In real life, the deprivation of one of your senses drives you to use your remaining senses more. I see it as no different in this case. Further, Arya has almost the same experience in later volumes as Blind Beth. The ashes fell like a soft gray snow. 
He padded over dry needles and brown leaves, to the edge of the wood, where the pines grew thin. Beyond the open fields he could see the great piles of man-rock stark against the swirling flames. The wind blew hot and rich with the smell of blood and burnt meat. So strong he began to slaver. Yet as one smell drew them onward, others warmed them back. He sniffed at the drifting smoke. Men, many men, many horses, and fire, fire, fire. No smell was more dangerous. Not even the hard, cold smell of iron. The stuff of man-claws and hard skin. The smoke and ash clouded his eyes, and in the sky he saw a great winged snake, whose roar was a river of flame. He bared his teeth, but then the snake was gone. Behind the cliffs, tall fires were eating up the stars. All through the night, the fires crackled, and once there was a great roar and a crash that made the earth jump under his feet. Dogs barked and whined, and horses screamed in terror. Howls shuddered through the night, the howls of the man-pack, wails of fear and wild shouts, laughter and screams. No beast was as noisy as man. He pricked up his ears and listened, and his brother growled at every sound. They prowled under the trees as a piney wind blew ashes and embers through the sky. In time the flames began to dwindle, and then they were gone. The sun rose gray and smoky that morning. Only then did he leave the trees, stalking slow across the fields. His brother ran with him, drawn to the smell of blood and death. They padded silent through the dens men had built of wood and grass and mud. Many and more were burned, and many and more were collapsed. Others stood as they had before, yet nowhere did they see or scent a living man. Crows blanketed the bodies and leapt into the air, screeching when his brother and he came near. The wild dogs slunk away before them. Beneath the gray cliffs a horse was dying noisily, struggling to rise on a broken leg and screaming when he fell. His brother circled around him, and then tore out his throat while the horse kicked feebly and rolled his eyes. When he approached the carcass, his brother snapped at him and laid back his ears, and he cuffed him with a forepaw and bit his leg. They fought amidst the grass and dirt and falling ashes beside the dead horse, until his brother rolled on his back in submission, tail tucked low. One more bite at his upturned throat, then he fed, and let his brother feed, and licked the blood off his black fur. The dark place was pulling at him by then, the House of Whispers, where all men were blind. He could feel its cold fingers on him. The stony smell of it was a whisper up the nose. He struggled against the pull. He did not like the darkness. He was wolf. He was hunter and stalker and slayer, and he belonged with his brothers and sisters, in the deep woods, running free beneath a starry sky. He sat on his haunches, raised his head, and howled. I will not go, he cried. I am wolf. I will not go. Yet even so, the darkness thickened until it covered his eyes and filled his nose and stopped his ears so he could not see or smell or hear or run, and the gray cliffs were gone, and the dead horse was gone, and his brother was gone, and all was black and still and black and cold and black and dead and black. Bran, a voice was whispering softly, Bran, come back, come back, now, Bran, Bran. He closed his third eye and opened the other two, the old two, the blind two. In the dark place all men were blind, but someone was holding him. He could feel arms around him, the warmth of a body snuggled close. He could hear Hodor singing, Hodor, 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 quietly to himself. Bran, it was Mira's voice. You were thrashing, making terrible noises. What did you see? Winter fell. His tongue felt strange and thick in his mouth. One day when I come back I won't know how to talk anymore. It was winter fell. It was all on fire. There were horse smells, and steel, and blood. They killed everyone, Mira. Later in the chapter. Three days, said Trojan. The boy had come up soft foot, or perhaps he had been there all along, in this blind black world. Bran could not have said. We were afraid for you. I was with Summer, Bran said. Too long. You'll starve yourself. Mira dribbled a little water down your throat, and we smeared honey on your mouth. But it is not enough. I ate, said Bran. We ran down an elk and had to drive off a tree cat that tried to steal him. The cat had been tan and brown, only half the size of the dire wolf's, but fierce. He remembered the musky smell of him, and the way he had snarled down at them from the limb of the oak. The wolf ate, Jojen said. Not you. Take care, Bran. Remember who you are. He remembered who he was all too well. Bran the boy. Bran the broken. Better Bran the beastling. Was it any wonder he would sooner dream his summer dreams, his wolf dreams? 
Here in the chill, damp darkness of the tomb his third eye had finally opened. He could reach Summer whenever he wanted, and once he had even touched Ghost and talked to John, though maybe he had only dreamed that. He could not understand why Jojen was always trying to pull him back now. Bran used the strength of his arms to squirm to a sitting position. I have to tell Asha what I saw. Is she here? Where did she go? Note how Bran is upset at how Jojen forces him to delineate himself from Summer. Bran is still not happy about his body, which probably adds to his zeal to spend more time in the able-bodied Summer. This is a theme in Bran's story going forward. When the boys are reunited with their wolves, we all feel a bit better about their situation. Still mirroring Bran's thought from this in intelligence, Summer is very careful and alert for danger as they reunite. Then Summer finds Maester Lewin. We readers have a brief moment of elation, only to fall back to reality, once we realize he's definitely dying. Two lean, dark shapes emerged from behind the broken tower, heading slowly through the rubble. Rickon gave a happy shout of, Shaggy! And the black direwolf came bounding toward him. Summer advanced more slowly, rubbed his head up against Bran's arm, and licked his face. We should go, said Jojen. So much death will bring other wolves besides Summer and Shaggy Dog, and not all on four feet. Later that chapter. Summer howled, then darted away. The gods would. Mira ran after the dire wolf, her shield and frog spear to hand. The rest of them trailed after, threading their way through the smoke and fallen stones. The air was sweeter under the trees. A few pines along the edge of the wood had been scorched, but deeper in the damp soil and green wood had defeated the flames. There is a power in living wood, said Jojen Reed, almost as if he knew what Bran was thinking. A power strong as fire. Later in the chapter. On the edge of the black pool, beneath the shelter of the heart tree, Maester Lewin lay on his belly in the dirt. A trail of blood twisted back through damp leaves where he had crawled. Summer stood over him, and Bran thought he was dead at first. But when Mira touched his throat, the maester moaned. Odor! Odor said moanfully. Odor! This is where Shaggy and Rickon's story parts from Bran and Summers, based upon Lewin's direction. Going forward, the pack is truly a bunch of lone wolves, though sometimes running with ordinary wolves. They are completely separated from their littermates, although we will see from the wolf dreams that they remember and sometimes sense each other. It is a nice touch that Lewin, the one whose magical skepticism chained Bran, seeks out the heart tree upon his death. It seems upon realization of his own mortality, he shed that skepticism, and might even have wanted to report a few things to the old gods, slash weirwood net. His last act, to send the boys away, literally unchains Bran from that skepticism, and from Winterfell itself. Reflecting back on Summer and Bran's story in A Clash of Kings, their bond has increased by leaps and bounds during this volume. The two most important aspects of it seem to be that Bran embraced his identity as a warg after having resisted it for early chapters and how Bran's powers have increased significantly in the aftermath of that acceptance. The sensory deprivation in the crypts seems to have increased Bran's telepathic power, which correspondingly increased the strength of their bond as well. Wow, that's it for Summer and Bran in A Clash of Kings. Join us next time as we tackle A Storm of Swords, Summer and the Winged Wolf, Unchained. Thanks to all the terrific artists who let me use their work on this YouTube video. Thanks as always to my family, including my wife, the brushed bombshell who provided art, my daughter who provided art, and my mother who has narrated Cat's POVs. If you enjoy this content, you can also consider supporting us on Patreon.